So, Fate the Wink Saga came out, and it's an oof. On its own, it's barely possible as a teen show that does nothing unique, but when you look at it through the lens of it being an adaptation, it quickly becomes even worse. This show does not understand any of the demographics it tries to reach, and as such, it quickly falls apart under the barest amount of scrutiny. Not only is the writing and characterization lackluster, but this show also has plenty of other problems, including the infamous whitewashing of several kick-ass BIPOC characters. I've made plenty of other videos about Winx Club, as well as a video foretelling the doom of fate. Ooh, that sounds cool. So feel free to check those out up in the cards or down in the description. That said, today I'm primarily going to be focusing on how the show handled each character through the adaptation, with some words on the world building specifically at the very end. Again, this is coming from a die-hard Winx Club fan who feels like this is a spit in the eye to the original franchise. With that said, please enjoy my descent into madness. There's been a lot of discussion on Alicia Applebaum's ethnicity in regards to Musa being whitewashed. As far as I'm aware, there's been no official confirmation, and Applebaum is not obligated to disclose that information if she doesn't want to. There was a rumor that I included in a bit of text in the last video about her being Singaporean, but apparently this turned out to be fake. But also, I was a dumbass because I thought Singaporean was both a nationality and an ethnicity? That is not the case. It is just a nationality, so wow. <laughs> Whiteness is a hell of a drug. However, Applebaum is still very much white passing, which is a shame given Musa is Asian coded, specifically Chinese coded. The role could have easily gone to a number of Chinese actresses who already face systemic barriers, keeping them from the same opportunities as white and white passing actresses. That said, Muse is actually well represented here in terms of personality. She's far rougher around the edges here given, well, everyone in the show is an asshole for some reason. But when it comes to her personality as someone who means well, but is a bit of a loner who's experienced loss, they pretty much hit the nail on the head. The biggest change to Muse's character is her powers. Music is still associated with her character, but it's been changed so it's a barrier she constructs to separate herself from others because of her new mind powers. She has no real offensive abilities as a mind fairy, but she can pick up on other people's emotions, as well as the presence of others. I actually find this change interesting. There's a line from the first movie where Musa says, I can hear all the music in the world, even the secret song in every person's heart, and I can sing it! It's a throwaway line, honestly, but I always thought it would be interesting to see her music powers open a door to empathic powers. Her music powers being completely removed is a shame, not only because it made her one of the more unique characters in terms of magic, but also because music was crucial to her character. There's a scene in the final episode where Musa talks about how when her mother passed, her empathic powers made her feel all the pain her mother did as she died. It adds to her need to keep away from people for fear of losing him. My mom died last year, Tara, and I was with her and I felt it the moment it happened. I can't feel it. Please don't make me feel it. Oh, no, it's okay. It's okay. And honestly, it's probably one of the very few moments in the show that actually got some genuine emotion out of me besides annoyance or confusion. However, music no longer being vital to Musa's character takes away a core bond between herself and her mother. She talks about wishing to hear her mother playing the piano and singing with her mother again like when she was little. I want to feel your arms around me. I want to laugh with you and sing together the way we used to. The entire universe is depending on me. I have to go home. Her father even swore off music when her mother died because the trauma was that profound. And it made for one of the best episodes of the entire series. So to see music taken away from Musa is a shame, especially because I would have loved to see those empathic powers explored through the music. Aside from that, Musa's only real storylines are her blooming romance with Sam and her awkward friendship with Tara as she warms up to people and goes, maybe human connection isn't so bad after all. And for what it is, I actually like how that friendship develops, with Tara getting Musa to come out of her shell and help Sam when he's in pain, and with Musa getting Tara to take action and not be a doormat for everyone else. Really, it's the only bond in the show that I actually sincerely am into. The only things that come close are Dowling's grandmotherly concern for Bloom and Bloom's strained and messy conflict with her mother, 
but the latter comes with its own host of issues that keep me from fully caring. So if I had to say which girl from Fate was handled the best, it would be Musa. Still doesn't give them a pass for the whitewashing though, or the fashion choices. The fuck is this raspberry reject color scheme? I admittedly have no clue how Razzies work, but if this show could win one in anything aside from the whitewashed casting, it should be for the wardrobe department. Stella would be ashamed. And speaking of Stella, I would like to propose an idea. This Stella, I'm pretty sure you don't love me, so. Well, I don't know you, <laughs> but I'm sure once I do, I'll find something to love. Yeah. Is not the same Stella that we're used to. Yes, you can say that about everyone on the show, but Stella specifically is radically different from how she is in the original series. She was loud, energetic, sociable, and knew good fashion like the back of her hand. This Stella, by comparison, is reserved, antagonistic, and dresses like a wine mom in her late 40s. In more ways than one. What is Stella wearing? No secrets in oh my god, I'm about to lose my mind. And the thing is, I actually kind of like the idea behind this new version of Stella. She's her own character, and which you prefer is more a matter of preference. It reminds me a lot of the radical shift in Sailor Mars' personality and values between the original manga of Sailor Moon and the 90s anime. So going forward, I would like to refer to the original Stella from the series as Sun Stella, and this live-action version as Moon Stella, mainly because of her mom. In the original series, Stella got her solar powers from her father, King Radius of Solaria, and her lunar powers from her mother, former Queen Luna. She's much closer with her father, and the two have an adorable father-daughter relationship for the most part, though Radius is shown to be rather aggressive and unaware of his daughter's emotions later in the series. I thought about what you would do, Dad. That's my girl. And I thought about what Mom would do. Oh, darling. And I put them together. Oh, well. But it explains why Stella is as outgoing and passionate as she is if she's more in touch with her solar side. By comparison, Fate has Luna in charge of Solaria, and she's nothing like she was in the original. She's a fierce ruler whose focus is gaining power, so her kingdom remains unchallenged and unthreatened. One of Luna's main goals is trying to accelerate Stella's training so she can basically be used as a weapon. So much so that Stella was pushed before she was ready and blinded her previous roommate, which Luna helped cover up because she legitimately would rather her daughter be feared by people thinking she intentionally blinded someone who crossed her, then seen as weak for the truth of it being an accident. And when Stella escapes her mother, she winds up developing invisibility powers, which kind of ties in her wanting to avoid Luna. Which, can you blame her? This Stella has fucked up, yes, but I also find it interesting to see how she could have turned out with a different upbringing. She's trying so hard to project strength, she essentially pushes everyone else away rather than asking for help. And it's also a shift given none of the Winx originally had these kinds of toxic and abusive relationships with their parents. The closest you get are Musa's father forbidding her from singing in season two, and Aisha's parents sheltering her and then trying to arrange a marriage for her, which they quickly give up on. The only real issues I have with her are in the form of her and Skye's relationship, but more so from Skye's side than Stella's. Stella is relying on Skye for so much emotional support that it's harmful to both of them, and Skye's just kind of going along with it because… I guess we need a love triangle. Stella's moment of acknowledging the toxicity of their relationship actually kind of hits for me. Breaking up was the right thing to do. I mean, we never should have got back together. We are codependent at best, toxic at worst. Next time I have to deal with it for myself. But more in the sense that it's Stella taking the first step towards standing on her own. I honestly couldn't care less about Sky in all of this. Could she maybe meet Brandon soon? Please? And let's not also whitewash him, please God, please don't do that. Sky and Riven are almost nearly indistinguishable as it is. Don't add another white man to the cast, please. So, yeah. I like this Stella. I still prefer OG Stella because she is a relatable queen, but like I said, two different Stellas. It's like comparing apples to oranges, or I guess comparing the sun to the moon. Okay, time to roast Tara. This should be fun. So, uh, 
Turns out there's a lot more to Terra than we once thought, and not all for good. Look, there's a blizzard outside right now, and I am snowed in and I'm tired. When Elliot Salt was cast for fate, it turns out she actually was supposed to be Flora. This is brought up in Modern Girl's video about fate, so I will link that up in the cards in the description. But it's pretty clear that Rainbow did intend to try and whitewash Flora by choosing a white actress to portray her. A decision which becomes more insidious when you see how Flora's skin tone has been lightened over the years across World of Winx and Season 8 of the animated series. So when the backlash started, the crew behind Fate likely decided that rather than find a Latina actress for Flora, they would instead change the character's name to have an excuse for her being white. Hence why we now have Tara, and why she randomly mentions having a cousin named Flora. It's a family thing, I've got this cousin called Flora. It's a last ditch effort to try and minimize the damage, but it makes it all the more obvious they intended to whitewash Flora the whole time. That alone has made Tara unlikable to most viewers, myself included. But whitewashing aside, she does have a decent story arc here of learning to stand her ground. She's very talkative, but has a hard time making friends, and often feels outgrouped by others. They also add in some casual fat shaming, which... And she's just three people in disguise. People always think that they can treat the big girl like shit. Yeah, I, I get they were trying to add some plus-sized rep to make up for the long-running criticism of the original designs, but you do that by having a cast filled with different body types and not having those body types be their entire characters. There's also the weirdly homophobic and biphobic stuff they do with Dane and Riven that we'll discuss later, which seems to be used to make Tara come across as a better, more righteous person to the audience. Like, oh, Dane was such a good guy when Tara hit on him, but now that he's with that edgy bad boy Riven, he's nothing but trouble. No thanks, I actually dislike Tara more because of this. So, uh, thank you. Bisexual rights. The only redeeming moments for Tara come in the form of her friendship with Musa. But even then, Musa's the one doing all the real work. I'm at least happy that once Musa came clean about why she couldn't help Sam, Tara didn't force Musa to go back. Musa decided to of her own volition. But again, Musa's the one doing 90% of the work. Out of all of the girls, they did Aisha the dirtiest. Aisha is one of the few cases of a new member of the group actually turning out to be a great choice. Hell, she's still probably the best ridden out of the main six. A princess of the ocean world of Andros, a fairy of not only water but any fluid, and a loner who grew up sheltered who seeks deep friendships and freedom. A complex main character who is a young black woman and a princess, we stan. So imagine the fury seeing Aisha and Fate not only having her powers watered down, God damn it, Bar! but also serving as Bloom's babysitter and a teacher's pet the whole time with no real story of her own. Bad enough that Flora and Musa being replaced and whitewashed respectively turned Aisha into the token black character. But you don't even have the courtesy to give her a complete narrative that isn't cleaning up after and sucking up to the white characters? The shame is that there isn't even much to say about Aisha here, because she's barely given any material to work with. She's not even a princess, for God's sake. Imagine if Andros and Solaria were rival kingdoms in this universe, and maybe that added to the conflict between Aisha and Stella. But nah. Aisha's backstory is wading through literal shit when her powers went out of control as a kid. I'm not joking, that's an actual thing that canonically happened. I flooded my entire secondary school after I failed a math test. Have you ever waded through human poo? I have. Not pleasant. Thanks. I hate it. If I had to summarize how they changed Bloom, it would be... they made her edgy as hell. Original Bloom wanted to be a fairy since she was little and never felt like she fit in on Earth. Fairies, myth, or reality. Ugh, don't you ever get tired of these silly things? They're not silly, okay? <sighs> She's a little cinnamon roll who, yes, has a bit of a temper. You're just a ridiculous, arrogant, pathetic windbag! <sighs> but ultimately means well. 
That is not live action bloom in the slightest. This bloom is completely self-absorbed. Wanting so badly to figure out who she is and where her powers come from, she winds up ruining everyone else's lives. She's basically what most bad faith critics painted Bloom as in the early days. And the thing is, it could have worked. If you want a more mature story, it actually helps to make your protagonist a bit more morally gray with major flaws. You just need to, you know, acknowledge those flaws, have those flaws called out, have there be major consequences, just saying. Instead, Bloom gets rewarded with transformation magic. More on that later. Through literally no training or insights, and everyone just coddles and praises her for the bare goddamn minimum. Aisha isn't even given a chance to call out Bloom for using her or talking past her. Dowling is too busy trying to comfort Bloom to lecture her for releasing a goddamn war criminal. And Skye's cool with Bloom knocking him out in a vulnerable moment because she decides to make out with him as magical zombies try to kill them all. Wow, such growth. There's also the weird dynamic between Bloom and her mother Vanessa. In the original show, Bloom's adoptive parents are loving and nurturing, and they've also known about her magic since day one. They just weren't sure how or when to tell her the truth. This Vanessa though, she does not own her own flower shop, in which Bloom appeared one night in a fire as a little babu, but instead comes across as a neurotic helicopter parent who does not believe in privacy whatsoever. She takes Bloom's door away because she's too introverted for Vanessa's liking, and Mike just goes along with it because he has the personality of sandpaper. This all comes to a head with Bloom setting the house on fire accidentally when her anger boils over, giving her mother third degree burns, and conceptually, I kinda like that. I like how dark we were willing to go, but we don't do anything with it. The parents don't know Bloom did it, or even suspect her, so any real tension we could have had is just gone. It ain't there, chief. Ultimately, Bloom's story of learning to control her emotions and trust people who mean well comes off as her learning that being a selfish idiot who stumbles into victory time and time again is ideal. And if your main character sucks, the rest of your story is bound to crumble. So, instead of having the infamous trio of witches, the tricks, this show instead decided to condense them all into one unmemorable character. They took Icy's ruthlessness, Darcy's manipulation, Stormy's powers, and none of any of their charm, and created Beatrix. Yes, B A Trix. I said it once, I will say it again. The fuck is this name? If you had to stick with the name Trix, then why not go for, I don't know, Trixie? Whatever. That all said, Beatrix is unironically the best part of the show. The person who wants to break into Downing's office thought you might want to help. And why would you think that? Because you're a guy and I'm hot. That's how low our bar is, fam. She's the only character who I actually feel invested in. And that is solely because she's shooting down everyone else's egos and playing them like fiddles. Homophobic gay bashing by a gif. Truly you've reached your peak clever. It's not her fault if everyone else is stupid enough to let her assume control. Oh my gosh, she radiates I did something bad energy and I'm fucking living for it. You are not the victim here. <laughs> Maybe not to you. But I can't promise the rest of the school will agree. Not to mention that I was actually fully on board with her at the reveal of the Asterdale backstory, where she's motivated by the fact that her family was killed by the professors of Althea. But then add in the fact that it was a village of blood witches, more on them later, and you get a genuinely interesting villain who seems like she's out for vengeance, but we don't fully know. And normally I would hate that, but honestly I'm on board with whatever so long as she kills everyone. To be real, She's everything Cinder wishes she was. I mean, I usually joke about how Icy is what Cinder should have been, but even Beatrix, a lesser amalgamation of the original Trix, is leagues better than Cinderfall. Wow. Oh boy, here we go. Okay, so 
we know the show why watched two characters turned the main black member of the cast into a token who exists to serve the needs of all the white people's stories took the chance to have a meaningful plus-sized rep and turn it into again token rep with fat shaming jokes so what gave these writers the idea that they could even handle LGBT rep? The only specialists from the original series still here are Skye and Riven. Riven is now given Brandon's role of being Skye's best friend, though not Squire, oddly enough. But Riven's primary role is just being an idiot who's led on by Beatrix. It would be similar enough to Riven being strung along by Darcy, except that OG Riven already had problems of being a sexist, self-centered jerk. This Riven, though, his biggest problem is being low-key homophobic towards Dane, which he's never actually punished for. <laughs> Dane himself seemed fine at first. I actually kind of liked him as a character who could have been either gay or bi who had a crush on Riven, but would have to get over it once he realized that Riven was just a jerk leading him on for his own amusement and advantage. It's a tired story for gay characters, especially when it's your only legitimately LGBT character, but it's something, at least. Got me out here begging for scraps, wow. Instead, they do this weird as hell polycule between Dane, Riven, and Beatrix, where Beatrix is leading them both on for her own agenda, which, great, we, we love not only polyamory being a villain-only thing, but also the only LGBT characters being antagonists fucking shoot me in the face. Bully the gay, she said no gay rights whatsoever. Damn. <sighs> for those unaware, polyamory is a practice of romantic and or sexual relationships between more than two people. Not cheating, as that involves deception and dishonesty, whereas with polyamory, everyone is on the same page and is 100% invested. I mean, honestly, it might be the only way to survive in this fucking economy, so. Ideally, Dane would have just realized Riven was a jerk and moved on, only for Beatrix to make Riven continue being a jerk to Dane. Instead, Dane becomes more of a Beatrix stan than Riven ever was, with both of them serving her by the end of the season, which, why? What's the purpose of any of this? And why is Dane so pissed at Tara? Yeah, he fucked up, but Tara's not obligated to forgive him, especially when she was nothing but kind and protective of him. And I can't even root for Tara because the low-key homophobia is making me hate her too. There's also the biphobia where Dane and Riven both fit into bisexual stereotypes of being problematic jerks who get with anyone and everyone. Say it with me, fam. Bisexuals are just as capable of entering and maintaining healthy relationships as anyone else. Whether you're a bisexual who prefers men, women, or anyone else, or you don't have any preferences, you are valid. I'm also going to take this moment to remind y'all bisexuals are in fact capable of loving trans and non-binary people because bisexuality is not inherently transphobic. I will not tolerate my LGBT brethren being shamed and demonized in my house, nor will I tolerate infighting when we should all be rising up to kill all of the cishets. I mean, let's be real. Do you really think any of the cis straight people understand any of us? Like, we're all one big collective to them. Like, they don't care about the differences. So, like, we should kind of work together. Oh god, now I'm scared of what Fate's attempt at trans rep might look like, and you know what? I'm, I'm not opening that door to hell. Not today. Maybe having a cis white guy directing this show about young women from a show praised for its diversity was a bad move. The professors are... Not that bad, actually. They do try to pull off this angle that they're kind of shady, but ultimately mean well. And for the most part, I don't mind it. I'm not sure if Farragonda's name has been changed to Dowling as much as Farragonda is now her first name. That said, she still fills the role of a fairy godmother figure to the girls. Well, actually exclusively to Bloom here because Bloom needs all of the attention in the world or else she'll probably burn down the school. My only real problem with Dowling is that they don't do enough with her. In the original series, Farragonda had a direct connection to Bloom's birth parents and most of the major villains. 
But here, Dowling's connection to Bloom is purely tangential. She helped destroy Asterdale, yes, but she had no idea Bloom was here, and doesn't have a clue as to who Bloom is. She can't even figure out Bloom as the dragon flame. Rosalind has to tell her before she kills her, so what was the point of telling her? And yes, we'll get to the death in Rosalind in a bit. There's also the fact that Dowling found Bloom in an abandoned Gardenia warehouse? What? How would Dowling know to look here? Why would she even be here? Not only does it make no sense, but it also robs Bloom of her agency. Stella offers the invitation to bring Bloom to Elfia, but it's still Bloom's choice to follow. And when Bloom is found out as an Earthling, she owns up and asks to be kept at the school. I beg you, don't send me away. I've always wanted to be a fairy with all my heart, and now I can make my dream come true. She's not the most active protagonist mankind has ever seen, but it's better than edgy Bloom just reacting to literally everything around her. And at least OG Bloom eventually does become more active. This edgy Bloom is just reacting to everything. As for Saul, aka Saladin, I don't care. Legitimately, I don't care enough about him, Sky, or Arendor. Oh, I'm sorry, Andreas, to analyze them. Same for Tara's father. Part of me kind of likes the idea of Flora being a bookworm because of her having a parent who's also a professor, but it's not Flora, it's Tara. Therefore, I don't care. The only adult character I genuinely like is Rosalind. She's ruthless and cutthroat and will do anything to achieve her goals. I actually like that we had that lead on with Rosalind calling out to Bloom, which evokes memories of her returning fans of Daphne, Bloom's late sister. And then surprise, surprise, it's not Bloom's kind sister who died trying to protect her. It's the former headmistress who wants to turn Bloom into a weapon of war. Kind of like what Luna wants to do with Stella. But even then, Rosalind's goals are still cloudy, so I'm still not on board with her. Her moment of killing Dowling is kick-ass, I will admit. But to see Dowling eliminated in the very first season is confusing. What was even the point of her if she was going to be done away with so quickly? I may be old, but I can still defend myself. <gasps> what the fuck are they gonna do about it? Thanks, I hate it. I saved the worst for last the world building itself. Winx is completely unlike most of its contemporaries. In S Snow, do you mind? Do you mind? Oh god, it's icy. She's trying to find her way back into the show and she's taking it out on me. Instead of going for the cliche fantasy world most of us are used to, it decided instead to fuse magic with futurism. Magic City is exactly what you'd picture a city of the future to look like complete with floating cars, airships, and other sci-fi elements. The Other Worlds, by comparison, is exactly what you would expect from your typical fantasy series, with an old castle devoid of any personality, and a generic forest. Even the name Otherworld is so boring. You couldn't call it Tiernan Og as a reference to the actual Tiernan Og and also the Tiernan Og of the original series? The magical universe was home to countless different planets, all with vastly different cultures and ecosystems, depending on what kind of magic reigned there. But the other world just looks like someone decided to pick some random British castle and call it a magical fairy realm. Even the fact everyone in the other world has a British accent, mostly English accents, is exhausting. I'm curious, were you actually able to create this new shade of pink? The only choice I do kind of like is that they condense the schools into one building. Practically, it was probably to save on location costs and to make production easier, but story-wise, it also keeps all the characters close together. They could have kept them as separate schools on the same campus, but I'll take what I can fucking get. But what I can't accept is what they've done to both the fairies and the specialists. Fairies apparently have lost transformation magic, likely as an excuse for the show to save on more expenses. They instead save it until the very end for Bloom, with her not having earned it in the slightest. But all it amounts to is Bloom sprouting ugly wings of fire and nothing else. No iconic transformation music, no cool anime poses, and worst of all, no fairy outfit? You couldn't even go for the badass warrior aesthetic of Bloomix to keep it edgy? Criminal. The specialists, likewise, are unimpressive. 
They weren't fantastic in the original, but they at least had access to airships and sci-fi weaponry to try and help the girls. And that also came with unique uniforms. Here, the specialists are all decked out in black because edgy, they have no armor, they have basic ass swords, and hate all of it. The only boon here is that anyone, regardless of gender, can be a fairy or a specialist, which is a fantastic change. The witches, however, got completely screwed over. Granted, the original series had a weird love-hate relationship with witches. They studied a cloud tower, and it's clear that they're meant to defend the magical universe from evil like the fairies, they just do it in a completely different method, relying on different sources of power. Witches like Griffin were noble heroes, but the show also tended to portray most witches as leaning more towards evil, to where many fairies are more than happy to paint witches with broad strokes as such. Like, I'm pretty sure a good chunk of the first three seasons were just the winks throwing microaggressions at witches. Come on, guys, we need to think about working together with the witches. Yeah, right, and I don't even like being in a crowd where there's a single witch! And then not facing any consequences for any of it. How dare you! Bring it on, broomstick! They fully committed to that here. There are no witches here, there's no cloud tower, Beatrix herself is apparently a fairy, but even on the off chance she is a witch, it makes her a blood witch, a human who uses sacrifices to attain magic. We never actually meet any blood witches this season, but they supposedly were the inhabitants of Asterdell, who kidnapped Bloom as an infant for her magic. I'm just, I'm so over all witches being painted as evil. Again, I'm exhausted. Please stop. Stop this man. Stop him. And the burned ones, also known as the ones who were burned in the burn book. Did I make a Mean Girls reference without actually watching Mean Girls? Yes, I did. Guarantee that's what 25% of the comments are going to be. Another 20% will be calling me anti-white. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not even sure what the burn ones are meant to be. Rosalind says they're humans who were transformed into these monsters by the dragon flame, and they're apparently vicious creatures who can infect others just by scratching them. They're basically zombies, except boring. We have so many monsters from the original series to go with. Ogres, ghouls, trolls, oh my. Even the Army of Darkness, which for a while I thought were the inspiration for the Burned Ones. But ultimately, the Burned Ones are nothing. I don't care what they are or where they come from, and no, I'm not scared of them, because they're boring, they're ugly, and they're uninventive. Woo, so, that was a lie. Fate the Wink Saga could have been an interesting departure from the source material, but it's clear it doesn't respect it whatsoever, and is trying so hard to be every dark, edgy paranormal fantasy series for teens <coughs> that it has no identity of its own. And you can tell how little I respect it because I burped and then I decided to keep it in the video because fuck this. It's a mishmash of other shows with the Winx names branded onto it. I'm only interested in a second season to see how the train wreck unfolds. But I think it's clear most Winx fans are not happy with this product. Maybe if you're not a Winx fan, you'll enjoy it. But even then, I don't think there's enough here for the show to stand as its own entity. It's a mediocre mess that's too busy trying to look cool to actually do anything cool. And that is the greatest crime. Aside from the whitewashing, fat shaming, terrible LGBT rap, biphobia, horrendous fashion, and so on so forth. Anyways, if you did enjoy this video and would like to see more content like this from me, then be sure to not only subscribe to the channel, but also to ring that bell for notifications because YouTube hates creators. And if you're willing and able, please consider supporting myself and the channel over on Patreon for early videos, video scripts, and access to the private Union of War Discord server. I'm the Unicorn of War, and Kesha deserved better. Oh yeah, one of Kesha's songs was featured here, and I was offended on Kesha's behalf. Disgusting. This is not the high road.